All right, so now that we've established kind of the recap, let's move on into the heart of uh, today's lecture, which is discussing modeling. So I'm going to present you with three different games. Um, they're not fun games. Well, to me, they're fun, but, you know, they're not, you know, games the way that football is. Um, but they're, they're three different games that we're going to show. Um, and when I say games, I'm talking about the larger context of game theory, which is... Uh, kind of like a branch of economics, though it's also a branch of math and um, kind of broader than economics in, in its own right. But it's a, I think in particular, kind of found its legs in economics, at least as, I, as I've seen. But it's a mathematical way of representing um, strategic interactions between uh, a few players, though it can be multiple. Usually it's um, resigned to a few players or if it is a lot of players, they'll, they'll be represented in similar ways so that it's kind of abstracted so that you can say something uh, meaningful about it. Um, so it might be like a continuum of a, continuum of a million players, um, but they all have the same kind of payout function, just different realizations of it. Um, at any rate, it's a way of representing things strategically, um, strategic interactions in a very abstracted way so it's very the models are typically very parsimonious very easy to follow um you know the solution concepts get gradually and gradually more difficult um but i think we can explain the heart of it um the heart of each model without going too in depth and i don't want you to kind of take away the solution concept i'm not going to be testing you on solving other game theory models um i just want you to understand Kind of the key things of what built what um, you know co constitutes a model. So who are the agents? What are their objectives? Um, what are the assumptions we're making? Uh, how are the agents interacting strategically? What are their actions? Um, that kind of thing. So the first model is the Hawk and Dove game, and this model kind of dates back to the the fifties. Uh, there was this uh, organization called RAND, Research and Development, which is a, um, a think tank which will look at more politics-based questions, but with a game theory type bend. Um, and they're kind of situated in a school of international relations called realism or neorealism, um, both, you know, similar flavor neorealism is just more kind of an updated version of realism. Um, but neorealism kind of looks at actors as being rational and um, self-interested and almost in opposition sometimes. Uh, and I don't want to get too much into realist theory, but we'll see it as it plays out um, with the Hawk and Dove game. But basically, uh, the idea of the model is that by actually increasing your arsenal, uh, you're more likely to see peace. And that seems co counterintuitive, and in large part it, it might be in, as it situates in the real world. Um, and that if you, you know, disagree with the model, that's perfectly fine, and a lot of international relations scholars will. Um, you know, there's many other branches of international relations line of thought, um, some being liberal, which has nothing to do with, like, American liberal versus conservative, but liberal more is the sense of, like, institutions and ideas matter, and then um, then there's another group in, in IR that's really big called constructivism, which is that the way that people as, uh, as actors construe their world um, matters. So uh, kind of different takes on, on the on the realist bend there, but um, this model is very um, realist in the sense of it assumes that people are rational and self-interested and that their objectives are, are you know, well-known, that the other player knows their own objectives, uh, and that they're, they're kind of acting in opposition, um, uh, which are, you know, kind of baseline economic assumptions to begin with. Uh, a lot of abstractions start with the idea that um, individuals in the economy are rationally self-interested. Um, and then, you know, if you want to tweak from there, you absolutely can. You can make 
um, an individual's objective function, um, the thing that they're trying to maximize, you can make that factor in other players as well. But, you know, kind of the starting point is this idea that individuals will act on their own behalf. Okay, so let's get into the model. Okay, so what follows is a useful application of an economic model applicable to a political science, science context. Okay, like I said, this is kind of about um, international relations, um, but it's using game theory type uh, methodology to, to answer an international relations question or an international relations problem. Okay, let's say you're the dictator of a country called Stankonia, which is named after an outcast album. Um, and you are having hostilities with a country called Riggedy Row, which is uh, from the, a band called, uh, the group music, uh, hip hop group called um, Das Effects from the early 90s, the guys who were saying like Wiggity Whack and all that stuff. Um, but uh, Riggedy, they're, they're, both of them come from uh, a Chappelle show skit that I really like. Uh, at any rate, so you're the dictator of Stankonia, you're having hostilities with a country called Riggedy Row, who is also led by a dictator. And the reason I make them dictators is when you introduce legislatures like a parliament or Congress, um, you have to assume that the legislators, the individuals in the legislature are acting in their own interests. So that adds, you know, a hundred different uh, different objectives and a hundred different actors in the model. So we're abstracting away from the idea that the countries are um, that the countries are uh, you know more complex than one person making a decision on behalf of the country. So already you have your first abstraction. You assume that it's one person making the decision. Okay, both governments have two options. You could be war hawks and prep your military, or you could be dovish and go for peace, but you can't see what the other government does. So you know that the other government is acting rationally. Um, you know that they're going to act in their own self-interest, but you can't see that basically they're making their decision at the same time. Um, imagine you have two, two dictators on with their finger on the button. Where's my hand? with their finger on the button, ready to send nukes or not. And, you know, the second you press the nuke button, uh, the other person has already responded. So it's either they press it at the same time and they can't see what each other is doing, or they don't press it at the same time and they still can't see what each other is doing. Okay. So if you're hawkish, let's say being hawkish in this case is nuking or going to war or whatever, and they are dovish, you win the war and you get their disputed resource V. So let's say you're going uh, in a war for territory. So you you're gonna you know send the nuke. They're not gonna send the nuke. They're gonna end up surrendering and you take uh, you know the disputed territory. They get nothing. If you on the other hand are dovish and they are hawkish, they'll nuke you. They'll get your territory. Okay. And then if you are both hawkish, so if you both send the nukes, some of the resource gets destroyed and you split, uh, you split the rest. So eventually you uh, both you know, come to a peace agreement, but by then both countries have kind of nuked themselves into oblivion. So there's some uh, destruction factor D. So V is the disputed resource. So let's say, let's say you have a country and you nuke the left hand, the eastern part part of it. You want the western part of it, right? So if you nuke them and they don't nuke you, you you nuke the eastern part. You take the western part B. Okay, if they nuke you and you don't do anything, they'll take your western part and your eastern part gets you know destroyed. Um, and if you nuke each other, you're going to have to nuke both sides. So some part of the uh, the part you want to take gets destroyed. Okay, and if you don't if you don't nuke each other, both people decide to go to peace immediately without having pressed the button. 
um, you have to go to negotiations, so there's some uh, cost to negotiating, but you end up splitting the resource. So you get half of the disputed territory, and then um, you subtract away the, the cost of going to negotiations. Okay, so here's a kind of biological uh, way to see it. This is uh, taken from biological game theory. Um, so it's actually not related to the political science contest, science context, um, but it's still the same economic game theory methodology in a different context. And I think the, the illustration is actually kind of cool. Um, so I don't know how much you can see in the actual video, but basically uh, you have two, two things here, um, two birds. We can still call them Stanconi and Riggedy Row. So let's say this is Stanconi's, oh, this is, geez, Louise. Okay, this is Stanconi's options. This is Riggedy Row's options, okay? Um, and these the payoffs are given as Stanconi's payoffs, okay? So if Stanconi go, becomes a, a hawk and Riggedy Row becomes a hawk, okay? Hawk wins 50% of the fights and is injured in 50% of the fights. So your payoff is the... Uh, the resource V, um, you know, the thing that you want, let's say you're fighting over the same piece of territory, V minus some destruction factor divided by two. So the resource gets some part destroyed, and then the part that isn't destroyed gets uh, divided up half and half. Okay. Let's say you're Stankoni, you become a hawk, and they're Riggedy Row, and they're a dove, so you basically nuke them, or in this case, you're just an angry bird, not like the game, the, just you're an angry bird. <laughs> um, so if you're a hawk and they're a dove, you get, you get the whole resource, right? The hawk is always going to win the fight, so you get V, okay? You get the resource. If you were, you as Stankonia are a dove, and Riggedy Row is the hawk, okay, you're fleeing, the hawk's attacking you, you end up getting nothing, okay? And then, um, if you're both doves, you win 50% of the fights, uh, but you're never injured, uh, it's just some negotiation cost, T, okay? So, even though the hawk is attacking you in this case, let's just say you run away, you immediately go to peace. Okay, so you, you don't actually see destruction, only in this case, you're seeing destruction when you choose to fight. Okay, so one, once again, this, the, if you're both hawks, both Stankoni and Riggedy Row, there's some destructive factor, you split the resource. If you're both doves, um, there is no destructive factor, but there's some cost in negotiation, um, which I'm going to assign to be zero in the next slide. Just to kind of simplify things, I'm going to put some values on it. And then if you're a hawk and they're a dove, you win everything, and if they're a hawk and you're a dove, you win nothing, they get everything. Okay. So let's put some numbers on it to kind of make it a little easier. So um, let's say T equals zero. So that's the negotiation cost. So if both players go for peace, um, it's instantaneous and, you know, peace is valuable. So uh, they'll both say, okay, let's not fight. Let's just split it up. That's like a an understanding that they have. They don't have to go to, they don't have to sue each other or anything like that. Okay, let's say the, the value of the disputed resource is 10, well, let's say it's 10,000 miles or whatever, 10,000 miles squared. And the, the cost of uh, a war is six. So let's say it's, you know, you'll destroy 6,000 miles or, or 6,000 miles squared or whatever. Um, and the, the values on this are kind of arbitrary. You know, 10 doesn't really come from anything. It's just um, what, I, what I'll later define as utility. It's just a utility so that we can rank the, the weight of V versus D, the, the weight of the resource versus destruction. So let, if we made destruction to be 12, such that D is greater than V, it's going to change your answers. If we made destruction equal to 7, um, it might change your answers, but it might not. Um, it's just a way of ranking things. Okay. What assumptions must we make about the dictators to get an answer? 
Say so. We're going to assume that they're the sole decision maker uh, in the in the nation. So Stanconia's dictator decides hawk or dove. Riggedy Rose, decision maker, decides hawk or dove. They don't have any interference from the legislature. We're also assuming that they're rational. We're assuming that uh, the dictator of Stanconia wants what's best for Stanconia. They're not just looking out for themselves. Um, and that they know what's best for Stankonia. They know um, they know what the full reign of payouts are. Um, they know that V equals 10. They know that D equals 6. Or they know the underlying model. They also know that the other player is going to act in their own best interest. So in the best interest of the country, I should say. Uh, and that the other person is rational. Um, and that both players know the that they can either be a hawk or a dove, and that the other player can only be a hawk or a dove. So they essentially know the outline of the game. They know how the game is, how the game works, and what the payoffs are, and they're acting to maximize the payoffs, which are both the payoffs for the Stankonia dictator and the overall uh, country of Stankonia, as well as the, the payoffs for the Riggedy Row dictator are, is also the the payoffs for the country of Riggedy Row. But they don't care about each other's payoffs. They don't. They know that the other player cares about their own payoffs. But me as the dictator of Sanconia, I don't care how well Riggedy Row does. And vice versa. The, the, the dictator of Riggedy Row doesn't care how Sanconia does. So we're, basically when it boils down to it, we're assuming mutual rationality and that they know how the game is played. Okay? And that they know that the other player knows everything about um, the game as well. Okay, so they, they're rational, self-interested, and they know that the other dictator is as well. They know everything about the payout structure. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in uh, the actual model. I'm going to bring in an Excel file here. And I'm going to label this the way we would um, a regular, like, regular old game theory model. So this is what's called a normal form that I'm doing, and the normal form is going to look like what's called a matrix, like a, you know, two by two set of squares, basically. Okay, so we have a hawk and dove, uh, and then hawk and dove, and up top is riggedy rows, actions, sorry, one second, if you would let me, Let's just decrease the font a little bit. Let's do this. Let's decrease the font a little more. Why is it doing that? That's fine. Okay, so riggedy row act rows actions are here. Riggedy row can be a hawk or a dove. Likewise, Stanconia's actions are listed here. So I'm just going to decrease the the font a little bit so that um. You can kind of see the whole thing. Okay, so these are Riggedy Rose actions. These are Stankonia's actions. Keep in mind, the players in this game are Stankonia and Riggedy Row. Okay, they're not Hawk and Dove. Hawk and Dove are not the players of the game. Hawk and Dove are the ways that Stankonia and Riggedy Row can act. You can either be a War Hawk or a War Dove. Those are terms that you know go back in political science you know, way back before political science was really called political science, you know, Henry Clay was considered like a war hawk, for example. Henry Clay was like a senator from, I think, like the 1800s. So a war hawk is like uh, someone who's um, always asking for war. Like, in the modern context, you might say, like, John McCain was a war hawk, whereas, like, Bernie Sanders is probably considered a, uh, a war dove, someone who's not necessarily likely to go to war. Okay, but these are actions, Hawk and Dove. They're actions for both players, but they're not the players. The players are Riggedy Row and Stankonia. Okay? So if they're both Hawks, what did I say would happen? They would split the resource, but it would be destroyed a little bit. So I had V minus D divided by 2 was their overall payout. Sorry. 
You can't see my face right now. V minus D over 2 was their payout. Okay, for both players. So what's V? V is 10. So 10. What's D? D is 6. Uh, was the payout for both players. And I, the way that it's traditionally labeled, so let me also decrease the font size here. And let me wrap text. So the way that it's usually listed is that player one, which is Stankonia, this guy, everything on the left side, you'll see their payouts first. And then you'll see a comma. And then player two, which is Riggedy Rose, payouts, the thing on the top side, will get their payouts listed second. So basically, it's going to look like this, V minus D over 2. Let me just do this. All right, so Stankonia's payout up top, Riggedy Rose payout is next. Okay, if Stankonia, Stankonia is a dove, and Riggedy Row is a hawk, these are Riggedy Row's actions up here, okay, if Stankonia is a dove, what does he get? Okay, if Stankonia is a dove and Riggedy Row is a hawk, Stankonia doesn't fight, Riggedy Row gets everything, so Riggedy Row gets the disputed resource V. Okay, if Stankonia is a um, hawk, right, these are Stankonia's actions, and Riggedy Row is a dove, these are uh, Riggedy Row's actions, okay, so hawk and dove, so Stankonia hawk, Riggedy Row dove, we'll go to that there. Stankonia gets everything, Riggedy Row gets nothing. And if they're both, um, they're both doves, they both get half the resource minus the cost of, uh, the cost of, you know, negotiation, V minus T over 2. So once again, this is, this right here, is Stankonia's payout when Stankonia is a hawk and Riggedy Row is a hawk. This is Riggedy Row's payout when Stankonia is a hawk and Riggedy Row is a hawk. This here is Stankonia's payout. Stankonia's payouts are always on the left. When Stankonia is a hawk and Riggedy Row is a dove, Stankonia's uh, actions are here, Riggedy Row's actions are here. This would be um, Stankonia's payout left when uh, Stankonia is the dove and Riggedy Row is the hawk. This will be Riggedy Row's payout when Stankonia is a dove and Riggedy Row is a hawk. And finally, this will be Stankonia's payout when Stankonia is a dove and Riggedy Row is a dove. And Stankonia's payout when Stankonia is a dove and Riggedy Row is a dove. Sorry, I said Stankonia. This, this is Riggedy Row's payout when Stankonia is a dove and Riggedy Row is a dove. Okay, so let's put in the actual numbers since I did assign values. So V equals 10, D equals 6, T equals 0. So let's do this again, 10 minus 6 over 2. So you have 4 divided by 2, right? So that'll be 2, and then 4, the same, it was the same payout for uh, Stankonia. So you get 2, 2, like a ballerina. So 0 and V we said equals 10, so 0, 10. And likewise, V equals 10, so I'm going to replace V with 10 here. And then we said T equals 0, so you're not subtracting anything. And then V equals 10, so you'd have 10 divided by 2, which is 5. So both players get 5 in this case. All right. So here's the actual payouts with the numbers that we created. Okay, so if they're both Hawks, they both get 2. If Stankonia is a Hawk, he gets 10. Uh, if Stankonia is a hawk and Riggedy Row is a dove, Stankonia gets 10. Riggedy Row gets nothing. If Riggedy Row is a hawk and Stankonia is a dove, Riggedy Row gets 10. Stankonia gets nothing. And if they're both doves, they both get 5. Okay, so what does that say? What, what would be the most efficient outcome in this case? Um, so the, in the case that they're both doves, um, they're both getting 5. So the overall resource is 10, right? Um, in the case that they're both hawks, uh, the overall resource is only 4. 
So this one is definitely not an efficient outcome in the sense of um, you, there's some resource loss. What, so by efficiency, I mean you can't really make anybody better off without making someone worse off. So you can make someone better off. You can make both of them better off by going from here to here. Okay. So this outcome here is not efficient because there's resource loss. And I'll go more into what efficiency means um, kind of in later slides, but I do want to kind of talk about it briefly here. Are these two outcomes efficient? Um, yes, in the sense that uh, there's no resource loss, right? Um, there is, they're both getting the total resources 10, right? So I can't make Stanconia better in this case. So I can make Stanconia better by going here, but in order to do so, I have to take from Riggedy Row. So you can't make uh, Stanconia better without taking from someone. So in that sense, it is an efficient outcome. Likewise, you know, this is the same outcome just flipped. I can't make Riggedy Row better, Riggedy Row has zero, unless I take from Stanconia. So it's not, um, it's not a more efficient to go from here to here. These three outcomes are all equally efficient. Okay. Um, but are they fair? Not necessarily. I don't think that, um, or maybe I shouldn't say fair. Are they equitable? Are they equal? No, because one player is getting more than the other um, by a large amount, and the other player is getting nothing. Uh, same thing here. So this one is probably the quote-unquote best outcome in that it's the most efficient outcome, and it's also the fairest outcome, the most equitable outcome. Um, these two are efficient, but they're not really fair or equitable. Um, and this one is fair, but it's not really efficient because there's resource loss. So you can make both players better by, by going from this outcome to this outcome. Um, so that's how I would rank the outcomes. I would probably say this is the best outcome. And then these two, um, you know, depending on how you weigh fairness versus uh, efficiency might be the next best, or this might be the next best, um, depending on, again, how you rate fairness versus efficiency. And that's, you know, kind of a normative question. Is it better to be fair or is it better to be efficient? But um, what's the actual outcome that will happen in the real world if we assume that both players are trying to maximize their own self-interest? So you think about it this naively, right? Um, if I were Stanconia, I'd either want, so remember Stanconia's payouts are on the left here, I'd either want uh, the 10 or I'd want the 5, right? I wouldn't want the 2 or the 0. Um, so basically, if I were Stanconia, I'd want the other player to be a dove, right? I, I would want one of these two outcomes. Um, but is that what, I, what it will actually happen in real life? We'll see. But if I were Stanconia, I would want one of these two outcomes. And if I were Riggedy Row, I'd want one of these two outcomes. I would want Stanconia to be the dove. Um, well, let's say, let's say I'm, I am Stanconia. You put yourself in Stanconia's shoes for a second. And assume that you know Riggedy Row is going to be a hawk, right? We have what's called the best response um, action that we want to take. We want to... We want to respond the best way possible to Riggedy Row being a hawk. Okay, so if Riggedy Row is a hawk, I had the option of being a hawk and getting a two, or being a dove and getting a zero, right? I'm going to want to be a hawk, because two is better than zero, right? If Riggedy Row is a hawk, I would rather be a hawk and not get zero. I'd rather fight and, you know, still get some of the disputed resource, even if there's destruction, Okay. Now, what if Riggedy Row is a dove? Well, if I know Riggedy Row is going to go for peace, I'm going to go to war. I would rather get 10 than 5. So I'm just underlining the best responses for Stanconia right now. So the best response for Stanconia, let me decrease the font again. So best response for Stanconia, if Riggedy Row is a dove. I want to be a hawk. If Riggedy Row is a hawk, I want to be 
the very best like no one ever was. I want to be a, a hawk. Sorry. And let me wrap that. Decrease the font some more so it fits. Okay, so I'm going to write that another way. Best response, riggedy row, being a dove. So this is like a more compact way to write it, equals hawk. Best response for riggedy row, being a hawk, equals hawk. Okay. So regardless of what Riggedy Row does, Stankonia wants to be, we'll say, Stanks, Stanks. So regardless of what uh, Riggedy Row does, Stank would benefit from his best response is to be a hawk. Okay, so if you're clever, you might say, well, Riggedy Row's payouts are the exact same thing, just mirror image. Um, so wouldn't Riggedy Row also want to be a hawk? We'll, we'll do it again. And we'll test that out. Okay, so now I'm Riggedy Row. I have the actions of being either a hawk or a dove up here. So let's assume that Stankonia is being a hawk, right? So my payouts are on the right here, two or a zero. Okay, so I have the option of being a hawk or a dove. I would rather be a hawk and get two. Oh, JK. I would rather be a hawk and get two. Okay. Then be a dove and get zero. And now let's assume that we know that uh, Stankonia is going to be a dove. I have the options between 10 and five. Okay. I would rather be a hawk again and get, ah, I did it again. Oops. Um, so I'd rather be a, a, a hawk again and get 10 than be a dove and get five. Okay. So in both cases, if I were, if I were riggedy row, my best response to stank being a hawk is to be a hawk. My best response to stank being a dove is to be a hawk. So if you know that, is it, this is the same same thing exactly as before with Stankonia. Um, it's just the mirror image. If you know that the other player is going to be is going to go for peace and be a dove, then you'd rather go to war. And if you know that they're going to war, you'd also rather go to war, right? Because you'd rather get some of the resource than none of the resource. Okay, so I'm just going to mirror image it again. So Riggedy Rose, best response to Stank being a dove is to be a hawk. And Riggedy Rose, best response to Stankonia being a hawk is to be a hawk. Okay, they have the exact same payout structure, so it should look exactly the same, their best responses. Okay, so I've underlined basically the payouts that correspond to best responses. Again, if Stankonia is being a hawk, Riggedy Row is the choice between two and zero. Riggedy Row chooses the two, so Riggedy Row's best response is be, be a hawk. If Stankonia is being a dove, Riggedy Row has a choice between ten and five, so Riggedy Row would rather be a hawk. So Riggedy Row's best responses are hawk and hawk. Um... And the best response payouts are 10 and 2. And if uh, you know that Riggy to Row is being a hawk, Stankonia's best response is 2, which is greater than 0. So Riggy, uh, Stankonia would rather be a hawk. If Riggy to Row is being a dove, Stankonia's best response is to be a hawk because 10 is greater than 5. So the mutual best response, the only one where both of them are underlined, the only one where... Um, uh, you know that it's kind of a stable outcome where regardless of what Stankonia does, um, regardless if Stankonia is being a hawk or a dove, Riggedy Row wants to be a hawk. Sorry, if Stankonia is a hawk or a dove, Riggedy Row wants to be a hawk. 
And regardless of whether Riggity Rowe wants to be a hawk or a dove, Stankonia will also want to be a hawk. So both of them want to be hawks, regardless of what the other player is doing. So we call this a mutual best response, the only one where both of them are underlined. Right? So uh, regardless of what each other wants to do, regardless of what the other player wants to do, um, both players want to be hawks. So in the long run, you'd expect um, kind of the situation to converge where both players are being hawkish. Okay, they, they both want to go to war, um, even if the other player uh, wants peace. Um, the only way you can kind of get around it is if they communicate in advance, hey, I'm going to be a dove, you should also be a dove, and there's some sort of like contract that they can sign where there's penalties for breaching the contract. Um, but if you know that, like if there's no penalties, and you know that Stankoni is going to be a dove, Riggity Rowe is, of course, going to want to be a hawk because 10 is greater than 5, right? So unless there's some sort of penalties, um, this situation is going to converge where they're both going to go to war. They're both going to be hawks because that's the only situation that benefits them regardless of what the other player does. Okay, we call it this mutual best response. And when there's a mutual best response, there's like a fancy term for it called the Nash equilibrium, which if you guys have ever seen the movie A Beautiful Mind from like 2001, I want to say, it's kind of an older movie with Russell Crowe. Uh, one of the best pictures, I think. Um, but it's about this guy, John Nash, who wrote this one paper about Nash Equilibrium and then wrote one other paper and then retired and won a Nobel Prize and absolutely deserved it because this, pa this paper changed game theory. But the idea is that, you know, regardless of what the other player does, it's in my best response to be a hawk. And if it's in both players' best response to do the same thing, um, the, let's say, economy, or in this case, the, the countries, the situation between the countries, will over time kind of start to move towards both being hawks. Uh, that's the equilibrium, we'll call it, um, where the settling point. And we'll define equilibrium more precisely in later lectures. We won't really talk about Nash equilibria uh, too much um, outside of this lecture, but it's just a solution concept where uh, it deals with best responses. And again, you know, I'm talking about it, but that's just to kind of give you the full model. Um, but I don't expect you to be able to solve this model. I just want to um, use this model for uh, illustrative purposes so you can see players, you can see their objectives, you can see abstractions, and you can see the concept of modeling as a whole. Okay? So, what outcome will happen? Both want to play Hawk. Okay? So, what outcome would be best? So, even though both of them are playing Hawks, really, any of these three, uh, sorry, any of these three outcomes are better because there's more resource to be had overall. People in both countries, as like, on total, are, are better off. But if you care about fairness, um, and you define fairness to be both players having roughly the same amount, probably dove dove is the best outcome. Okay, so dove dove is uh, better than hawk hawk for sure, because five five is better than two two, um, and these two outcomes might be better than hawk hawk, um, because there's more, um, you know, there's more overall resource, you know. But if you care a lot about fairness, if you weigh fairness higher, um, you might still say that Hawk Hawk is better because at least in that case, um, both countries have a little bit, even if um, there's resource loss. Okay. All right. So what happens if I change the answer to, or if the, how would your answer change if I change D, which was six to 11? Okay. So Reminder that uh, D only factored in into Hawk Hawk, so it was V. So let's take off this underline first. Dude. Take off the underline. V minus D in parentheses oh, divided by 2. V minus D divided by 2. So these were your payouts, and these were the only payouts that had a D in them. 
Um, so if V equals 10 and D equals 11 now, so you have negative 1 uh, in the numerator and 2 in the denominator. So basically you're going to have negative 1 divided by 2, negative 1 divided by 2. Uh, sorry. Ah, not. I don't want an emoji there. I want negative 1. So negative 1 half, negative 1 half. Let's get rid of the um, underlines because I changed the payout structure, so we'd expect the best responses to change. Okay. So if negative 1 half, negative 1 half is now your payout, how does your answer change? Okay, so let's take stank, uh, riggedy row. Remember, these are riggedy rows actions up here. Let's fix riggedy row as being a hawk. What's Stankonia's best response to riggedy rows being a hawk? So if riggedy row is a hawk, I would rather as Stankonia be a dove and get zero than negative one half. So now already we see the best responses have changed. Stankonia would rather be a dove if riggedy row is being a hawk. Okay, uh, what if riggedy row is being a dove? Okay, remember these are Stankonia payouts on the left. If Riggedy Row is being a dove, Stankonia would rather be a hawk and get 10 than 5. Okay? So now, Riggedy Row, uh, Stankonia's actions do depend on Riggedy Row. Okay, now let's fix um, Stankonia's actions and see Riggedy Row's payouts. So Riggedy Row's payouts are on the right, negative 1 half or 0. So if Riggedy Row is a hawk and Stankonia is a hawk, Riggedy Row gets negative 1 half. But if Riggedy Row is a dove and Stankonia is a hawk, Riggedy Row gets zero. Zero is better than one half, so uh, than negative one half. So Riggedy Row would rather be um, a dove if Stankonia is being a hawk. Now, what if Stankonia is being a dove? Riggedy Row would rather get the ten than get the five because ten is greater than five. So Riggedy Row would rather be a hawk than a dove. Okay. So now what happens? Now we have different different sets of mutual best responses. Okay, so we can change these guys up here. I'm just going to delete them, um, and we can rewrite them. So if if Stankonia is a dove, Riggedy Row wants to be a hawk and get all of the resources. Oh. Ah. Jeez, I am messing this up here. All right, if Stankonia, Stankonia is a hawk, Riggedy Row wants to be a dove. Okay, so put in other terms, the best response, so best response for, let's call it Stank, S for Stankonia, of Riggedy Row being a, I'm sorry, we're doing the best response for Riggedy Row. Um, let's do this. Riggedy Row's BR for S being a dove is Hawk. Riggedy Row's best response for S being a Hawk is to be a dove, right? So in, war, in layman's terms, what this is saying is if I know that Stankoni wants to go to war, I want to go to peace. And if I know that Stankoni wants to go to peace, I want to go to war. Okay, and we could just flip this. If Riggedy Row is a dove, Stankonia wants to be a hawk, and if Riggedy Row is a hawk, Stankonia wants to be a dove. So Stankonia's best response to Riggedy Row being a dove is to be a hawk, and Stankonia's best response to Riggedy Row being a hawk is to be a dove. So it's mirror image. So basically the whole idea is that if war is so deadly that nobody wants to go to war, you'll only 
you only attack the other country if you know that they're already going to peace. Um, so in this case, we have two sets of mutual best responses or two sets of Nash equilibria. Basically, both countries are okay going to peace if they know that the other country is going to war, and both countries are going okay going to war if they know that the other country is going to go go to peace. Okay, so in this case, uh, the equilibrium is going to settle into one country is always going to say that they're going to go to war, and one country is always going to say that they're going to go to peace. And it's kind of arbitrary which country that is. So it, it depends on kind of things outside of the scope of game theory, like um, customs. So let's say, let's say in the real world, um, Stankonia is, is like a, you know, big man country. It's Vladimir Putin, right? Um, you know, a country that you don't think will ever settle for peace, you know, regardless of whether they're rational or not. Um, or they might be a completely irrational country, um, or they, they per, they're perceived to be irrational um, by the other the other country, right? Now we're already kind of moving away from the abstractions of game theory. Um, we're saying that the other country might not be completely rational. They might always go to want, or might always be perceived as wanting to go to war. You know, Vladimir Putin, big big man style, right? Um, in that case, you know, if you perceive that the other country is always going to want to be a hawk. So if you're Riggedy Row and the other country's always going to want to be a hawk, you're always going to go to Dove. So, you know, if the customs, if the culture of the situation or just, you know, your read of the situation um, dictates that the other place in person is more likely to be a hawk um, and always going to prefer this outcome, you're actually going to kind of whimper down, right? You're going to be the Dove. You know, this is, this is like alpha versus beta male, if you want to go on that terminology, right? And that's kind of how it factors into, you know, biological game theory. If, you, if you're the perceived beta male, it might be a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that you're going to go to zero. And I just want to step aside here. I don't condone uh, the idea of, of people being bucketed in the alpha or beta male. I think there's that's a goofy label and... Um, it's it, to me, it's stupid. I, I don't know if you subscribe to that, fine, whatever. But I don't think there's such a thing as an alpha or beta male. Maybe that means I'm a beta male. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but let's say let's say that you do perceive that you are a beta male and that the other person is an alpha male, and uh, you're riggedy row. This is probably the equilibrium that's going to happen in real life. Um, if you're Stankonian, and you perceive that the other person that Riggy Rose, the alpha male, this might be the, the situation that happens in real life. Um, so, you know, game theory is uh, agnostic on whether or not it's this equilibrium or this equilibrium, but they will say that these are the equilibria and that these, these two are not if war is so destructive. So what, what's the takeaway here? Basically, I increased D, I increased the destructiveness component, the cost of doing warfare. Um, I've basically said war, warfare is now so destructive that neither, neither player wants to engage in costly warfare. So uh, the equilibrium is going to be that you're going to have peace. It's just going to be an unfair peace, basically, where um, countries are, um, you know, there's a big man country who will get all of the resource and a little man country who won't get any of the resource. Okay. So how does that apply to the real world? So I, I kind of talked about in the sixties and the fifties, there's that country, uh, that company, uh, the think tank, uh, RAND, which stands for research, research and development. And the idea of neorealism and mutually assured destruction um, kind of pioneered by this guy, Kenneth Waltz. So the idea was that Kenneth Waltz basically said, okay, in order to prevent war, we have to kind of present ourselves as the big man. We have to present ourselves as, um, you know, stockpiling nuclear weapons. And it sounds really counterintuitive, but, you know, if you assume that, you know, the game plays out the way that, that, that it does here, 
you know, which by by its nature entails that you're assuming that both, like, let's say it's the United States and uh, the Soviet Union. If you assume that the players of the United States and, and the Soviet Union, let's say Nixon and um, uh, Khrushchev or Brezhnev, um, I think either either Soviet um, uh, chancellor, not chancellor, either Soviet leader would have um, the leader of the, the the Communist Party at the time um, would would have overlapped. So let's say it's I, I'm not that great at history, but let's say it's Khrushchev and and uh, Nixon, right? It would have been in both Khrushchev and Nixon's interest to stockpile their nuclear weapons to make their destructiveness component so high that both countries are not going to want to go to hawk, right? And you want to be the higher one so that, you know, you're the one who's going to be hawk if the other player is dug. Um, so you get the 10 and they get the zero. Um, so that, that's the idea of mutually assured destruction, having such a high destructiveness component that both countries know that they're not going to want to go to war has such a high nuclear weapons stockpile that, you know, if the other player decided to shoot their nukes, you'd also shoot their nukes, and both countries would be devastated. So in advance, they're going to say, no, let's not shoot our nukes. Um, and, and mutually assured destruction is basically this, this payout here. This is your mutually, destructive, mutually assured destructiveness payout, where um, mutually assured means... Both countries know that the other country will destroy them. Them. Okay. So the idea of neorealism is, you know, assuming everything in this model holds that both players are rational, both Nixon and Khrushchev are rational, um, that they know that the other player is rational, and that they are going to act in their country's best interest. Um, right. So neorealism kind of prescribed. They, they said, if if you know that that's the case, you're going to want to you're going to want to stockpile nuclear weapons. And there are competing international relations schools, which say, okay, you know, first of all, your assumptions are all wrong. You can't assume that Nixon's rational. You can't assume that Brezhnev's rational. They might be acting um, solely for the benefit of the the certain political class or they might be acting for their legacy or they might be acting on behalf of the country, but they might, um, they might not know the payoff structure. They might think, you know, the destructiveness component is lower than it actually is, or that they're always, they might think that they're, regardless of what the other player does, they're always going to win the war. Um, and they're always going to be hawkish in the end. Um, you know, they might not know the payout structure, or they might think that the other country doesn't know the payout structure. All, all completely possible in in real life, but um, you know, in terms of solving the model, um, maybe not the most um, most effective at abstractions. Because once you start throwing in individual irrationality, the model becomes way less and less predictable. Um, and that, that might be good in terms of describing the real world, but in terms of solving the model, um, it might not be, um, or it definitely isn't if, if it's way more, more complex. Um, so let's move on. So in what ways is this an abstraction from real world politics? I've already kind of stated this. Uh, number one, you're assuming that both players are rational. Number two, you're assuming that both players know that the other player is rational. Number three, you're assuming that both players know the payout structure and the rules of the game. Number four, you're assuming that both players are confined to being either a hawk or a dove. Uh, that there's no other there's no other way around. That there's no um, you know kind of ramp up where you can be a little bit hawkish and kind of inch into dovishness, or be a little bit dovish and inch into hawkishness. Um, you know, you're assuming that players aren't overconfident, that they, that they don't think that their payout is better than the other, uh, country's payout. Um, you're assuming very specific standards for what the payouts are. In this case, we're assuming the destructiveness component, 
um, is 11 versus being 6, which changes the model completely. Um, you're, we assume that they're dictators and that they have sole control over the country versus having a legislature that might, you know, rein them in. Okay. If you were a political scientist, how would you evaluate this model? Well, it all depends. It depends. Do you think the um, abstraction is justified or not? Do you think the assumptions made are realistic? Do you think that they'll hold up in the long term? If you're a neo-realist, um, you do. You do assume that uh, countries are acting in this, this fashion. But if you're, let's say, a liberal, um, which is a competing school, um, you might think that, no, people care about peace, rulers care about peace, um, there, there should be institutions that rein them in, and that, you know, they could be the legislature within the countries. So, by virtue of having, you know, 538 policymakers in the United States, um, it might be easier to uh, kind of, you know, evaluate peace or, or go for peace, or it might be harder depending on the legislature, but ideally you'd want a legislature um, that acts in the country's best interest versus just like a, the dictator's best interest. And you'd expect people maybe to, like if you're a liberal, like a international relations liberal, not a Democrat, right? If you're a liberal, you'd expect, you know, voters to care about peace, or you'd expect uh, individual businesses to care about peace because the, War is costly and it affects their bottom line. So if you're a liberal, you might say, no, this model is not realistic um, because although it might lay out the cost of war, um, it's just going to lay out the cost of war in terms of resource loss. But um, you'd have individual voters who would vote out um, the, the, the person making the decision. Or you have an institution like the United Nations who might sanction uh, might sanction the the individual dictator or something like that. And then the realist would go back and say, does that actually hold up in history? Probably not. Um, uh, you know, dictators have kind of acted on their own behalf without sanction from the United Nations or from the League of Nations, and that's kind of how World War II started, right? J Japan uh, invaded China, Germany invaded Poland, and, you know, uh, or Ger first Germany invaded Czech Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland, and, you know, the international regime didn't step in and do anything. And you might say it's happening now. I don't want to go into international politics, but we see countries invade other countries uh, all the time, and the United Nations doesn't really step in, um, or sometimes cannot step in just because the United Nations doesn't really have the power to. Um, unless it's like a kind of a smaller country, in which the, which case they might. Um, so if I were a political scientist, I'd say this might hold up in, in actual fact. But if I were designing a system, what I would do is I would design an international system where the cost of doing warfare might not just be, um, you know, the cost of resource destruction. I might design a system where, you know, the United Nations can step in and make warfare more costly. So if two countries are going to war, both countries immediately get sanctioned um, so that it's harder for those countries to uh, conduct business with non-parties to the war. So already you're increasing the destructiveness component and kind of assuring that um, both countries won't want to go to war. Um, so again, if I were a political scientist from the realm of uh, realism, I'd say that this model is going to hold up, but if I were a liberal, I would say, all right, let's design a system so that this model doesn't hold up. And then there's like a third branch called constructivism, which is basically, it depends on the, the, the culture and it depends on the, the, um, the thought process of, uh, who's in power and, you know, is it a legislature? Is it a dictator? That kind of thing. And, you know, it's kind of like a middle ground between um, realism and uh, liberalism or neo-realism, neoliberalism. Um, so that's all to say that, yes, the abstractions might be too, too broad, but we have to consider them. 
we have to know exactly what our abstractions are, um, and we might design a system that accounts for the abstractions and, and um, plays with them a little bit so that uh, the incentives for for going to warfare are lower, regardless of what your what your philosophy is, if you're a neo-realist or a neoliberal or a realist or a liberal or whatever, or a constructivist. Okay, so we've assumed rationality. We've assumed that there's only two options. Hawk and Dove. Another big thing is that we've assumed that there's no communication, that they're both making their decisions simultaneously, uh, which is big, because if I were talking about actual life and I was talking about, like, um, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis... Um, both countries are kind of escalating things, right? Where the Cuban Missile Crisis was like Russia or the Soviet Union put missiles in Cuba and the United States um, was like, we can't have missiles pointed at us, so we're going to escalate. And then the Soviet Union is going to escalate and they're um, gradually escalating to the point where it's like almost nuclear warfare. Um, but it never really happened because it was kind of more of a continuous time frame versus everybody makes their decision at once. Um, it, and research the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's like a good set of, it's like a cartoon, but it's a really informative uh, cartoon about, um, you know, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis from, it's called Extra History, and they'll just go through how we almost went to nuclear war with the Soviet Union and Cuba, um, which would have been a disaster. But, um, you know, if there's communication, if, if both players are both uh, Stan Coney and Riggity Row are like, no, 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 we're definitely going to be dovish, that, that changes things. Um, or if they say, we're, we'll be dovish, but you've got to be dovish too, that changes things too. Of course, um, you know, countries can lie. <laughs> so communication matters, but it matters to an extent. It could be the case that the Soviet Union is like, no, 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 we're going to be dovish. You have to also be dovish. We'll be dovish if you're dovish. Um, but then the second that the United States is like, okay, we'll be doves, Cuban, uh, the Soviet Union then, then nukes the shit out. Nukes the, nukes the, the crap out of us. Um, you know, communication can matter, but it, it matters to an extent. And I, I, I play around with this with the, the journal that I'm going to assign you know, and just a reminder, um, your journals, you only have to do two of them this semester, but the first journal I'm going to assign is going to look at um, how, how players communicate in a very similar model. It's, it's called, um, it's, a, it's a game theory, game, like game show, game theory based game show it's called Splitter Steel, and it looks at a very similar model, uh, which is called the Prisoner's Dilemma. But I, I show you what the payouts are for, you know, splitting and stealing. And then you have this one guy, um, I think his name is Ibrahim, and he goes uh, on about how his, he communicates, regardless of what you do, I am going to steal the money. Um, so you should also steal the money. Um, and he kind of like tricks the other player. And uh, he plays around with communication and and mutual rationality and that kind of thing. So I, I ask you to, to look at how the prisoner's dilemma plays out in, in the real world when there is communication um, and what the communication essentially means. Um, so that's your first journal assignment. It's, I think it, it's pretty interesting and um, you know worth looking at. Um, it's probably one of my favorite of the five journal assignments. So, so take a look at it if, if you can and um, evaluate it in the context of this Hawk and Dove model. Okay, so in my opinion, this model is 100% simplistic, it's reductive, um, but it also kind of gets at the core of what, what's going on with the theory, right? Um, right? I just listed like 10 different ways in which, in, in which it's an abstraction, um, and 10 different ways in which it might not hold out in real life, but it does kind of say something useful about, you know, where things kind of tend to if left unchecked. You know, if 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 the if the assumptions do hold, um, the, this is how it's going to play out. We we do want a higher destructiveness component, 
and we want to kind of be on the edge of the higher destructiveness component. We want to be the country with the, the bigger nuclear arsenal um, because that's actually better for actually getting to peace. And if you're the, the country that's winning the arms race, you're going to get the resource. Um, and if you're not, you're going to lose the resource. That, that more or less kind of holds true for um, an unchecked system. But then, you know, if, if you want to say that the, the situation won't play out that way, then I would say design a better system so that you can kind of get around that, so that you can penalize countries going to war so that they go to peace. Okay, I'm going to stop there.